stop. Last night, literally, last night, my kids, so at 7 o'clock, I said to my, I said to my kids, no more technology. And um, from 7 to 8, there was not a noise to be had in my house, to be heard. And I'm thinking to myself, what is going on? And I walk in the room, and my boys are just doing their own time quietly. And it was like the most peaceful time. It was perfect for me to put the final touches of my message, but it was such a peaceful time, which is so unheard of in our household because there's always Xbox or tablets or fighting or competitive four square out front or something. But for an hour, there was not a sound to be heard. And I thought to myself, this is good. I think my children acknowledge that themselves too. This is good just to rest. So, amen. Genesis 1 is where we're going to be this morning. So speaking of kids, one of our favorite places to go to is the Arizona Science Center. Anyone ever been to the Science Center? It's so, so much fun. I was bummed. I did not hear that they were building a volcano this past week and lighting that thing up. Was anyone there for the volcano eruption? Yeah, I didn't see you on the news, so I didn't figure you were. But So out front, they had built this massive volcano because they've got a new Pompeii exhibit there at the Science Center. And uh, I was really kicking myself for not being there for that. But speaking of the Science Center, one of my favorite parts of the Science Center is when you go upstairs and you stand on a platform and you get to experience all sorts of wet weather conditions. Do you know the place I'm talking about where you sit in this little enclosed area, stand in this enclosed area, and the wind starts whipping around as if you're in a hurricane? And then not only with the wind, the water starts coming down and you're starting to feel the power of what it would be like to be in a hurricane or a tornado to experience the wind and the rain. And then there's fire, you know, for uh, representative of, of different cataclysmic events that happen in the earth. And you feel, all, you know, it, the fire comes after the water because it dries you out, which is good because you don't want to walk around the museum all soaking wet. Amen. So the fire comes and you're feeling all these sensations that people experience in different parts of the world to remind us how powerful weather is. And I'm thinking about something tangible like that. And I'm praying, God, show us the power of creation, because that's that's what we're getting a little foretaste of is when we look at Genesis, it's kind of like a spiritual standing with God to say, what was it like when you created the world? What was it like when you created light? What was it like when you created the oceans, et cetera, et cetera? My prayer is that in a, at a spiritual level, we will experience like we experienced at the Arizona Science Center, the power of God in creation. So today we get to look at day two and three. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter one. And uh, we are barely kicking a dent in this series in origin. So... Uh, but I think it's worth our time because these are important truths we get to examine. There's a reason why God has given us the account he has given to us, and we ought to stop and not rush through why these things are important. So today we look at day two and three. Next week we'll look at day four and five. The following week we'll look at day six, which is the creation of man, woman. We're going to spend some time there because we're going to talk about important issues regarding who we are as men and women involved in that and these are a few weeks away but we're going to talk about what does it mean to be a man what does it mean to be a woman what does it mean to be a sexual creature we will address current topics regarding sexuality some controversial topics that i feel as a pastor need to equip you as the church as we look and engage in a world that is really sexually confused all around us and so we're going to spend some time talking about that we're going to talk about marriage we're going to talk about a man's role in marriage a woman's role in marriage we're going to talk about parenting see how all this is relevant so genesis is very relevant to our lives today all that in the weeks to come but today let's just worry about creation day two and day three genesis one starting at verse six god said Let there be an expanse, and there was in the midst of the waters this expanse. Let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. Sometimes when you read the Bible, don't you feel like you're reading a Dr. Seuss story? 
It's like, wait, I'm trying to follow the, the line of thinking here, and we'll talk about that here in a bit. Verse 8, and God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning a second day. And then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and gathering of the waters he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed in their kind, and trees bearing fruit and seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning a third day. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. So what we continue to see that we saw last week is this principle of separation taking place in creation. So God continues separating things he's created. Last week we saw him separate the light from the darkness. And even though he had not created a sun or a moon yet, we, we saw how important it was to understand God as being the ultimate source of light because light has to do with the nature of God himself. We talked about the Spirit's protective presence hovering over the face of the earth, energizing it, just like the Spirit does in the believer's life, energizing and awakening and quickening our hearts. Well, today we come to the creation of, of, of three things, really, we're going to talk about. There's going to be sky, and there's earth, and there's vegetation. And so, day two, we're going to start by looking at the first point in your notes is that God is bringing order to creation, Remember, the earth was formless and void, somewhat in a chaotic state. Now he's bringing order to creation. And what's amazing is he's really creating a habitable environment. He's got, a, a, in his mind, a plan to put life on earth. So he has to create a planet in which it is habitable for the life that he is ready to create. And so here he does in verse 6. He then says there's this globe covered with water, as we saw at one point in history, long time ago, the earth was completely enshrouded by water. And God on day two says, I'm going to split the water and put an expanse between the waters, meaning he separates the waters so that there's now waters above and there's waters below. And he creates a horizontal gap between the waters we now call sky. That's what's happening here. And so all of a sudden now, at this point, there is a canopy of water shrouding the earth, a sky layer, and then the waters that now cover the earth. And so what we have to understand is that this idea of dividing the waters is so that we can have an atmospheric condition for life to exist in. Now consider this. He spreads out this expanse. Literally, the word is he pounds out and thins out the air for the earth so that life can now be accommodated within it. There is a cycle in our sky today of condensation and precipitation that is needed to sustain life. Now, we're going to get into nerd science territory here, but you need to understand that what the Bible says is right on line with scientific exploration today. The earth alone possesses an atmosphere capable of, of sustaining life, and it is unique, and there's no other planet like it in our solar system. If you need to stop and consider and be in awe of God, other planets have atmospheres, but none of them are like ours because ours is composed of certain combination of gases that allow us to exist. Now, you may want to write these down in your notes. There is just the right amount of oxygen for us to live because a single spark, if there was more ox oxygen, would set the world on fire. Any more oxygen than we have now, this place would be lit up and explode. There's also nitrogen, and if there were a lot more nitrogen, we would suffocate. So now there's this balance between oxygen and nitrogen, and let's insert a third element, carbon dioxide. This is essential for plants to live, but is deadly to humans in large quantities, and there is a perfect 
balance of carbon dioxide within our atmosphere. Now, by comparison, Mars, much to the dismay of Matt Damon, the Martian surviving anywhere, the atmosphere of Mars is 95% carbon dioxide, and it's one reason why you will never be able to survive on Mars. So now we have this atmospheric condition created by God, this visible expanse we call the sky, and now God says, I'm going to put this expanse there, and we're going to call the atmosphere above the sky, which is where the clouds exist, and we're going to call the waters below the sea. This is why we call it the blue sky. You ever thought about, like, oh, what beautiful blue skies we have? Because there is water in our atmosphere. Now, I'm not going to go into nerdville and talk about the layers of atmosphere. I'm going to specifically talk about the troposphere. So the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the ionosphere are not going to be discussed today. I'm sorry. But the troposphere is the very first layer of atmosphere that holds an insane amount of water that God at this moment sustains by his very power. Now, let me take you to some scripture, and then I'm going to go back to the science. Psalm 33, even the psalmist declared in verse 7 these words when he writes, He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap, and he puts the deeps in the store in storehouses. God is in control of what he's going to do with the waters. Then the psalmist continues in Psalm 104. And let me just tell you, if you want some good meditation passage this week, look at Psalm 104. Here's what he says in Psalm 104, verse 6. You covered the earth with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. So here at one point, the earth was shrouded by water. Now he separates the waters by inserting a horizontal layer in between the waters called the sky. The primary purpose for God to create this troposphere is so that there would be now this way of suspending billions of gallons of water above the earth. Stop and consider this with me if you would. That there is just the right amount of water in our atmosphere to sustain plant, animal, and human life on earth. Just to give you an idea, currently, the amount of vapor, because we know that water can exist in three states, what are they? Gas, liquid, and solid. So in a vapor form, currently, Suspended in the air above us is an estimated 54 trillion 460 billion tons of water. Water is 773 times the weight of air, so that gives you some idea of the power required to separate the waters from the waters. So now there's this troposphere, this atmospheric layer just above the ocean where clouds form and humidity resides. And we need to consider the fact that you and I take it for granted. You never knew, perhaps before this morning, unless you're a nerd, like some people, that there are 55 trillion pounds of gallons of water being sustained above us on a daily basis. God, certainly in his wisdom, knows what is required to sustain life on earth. And it's all held together because of his mighty power is that not incredible now let me get more specific because i want to share with you this idea that there are farmers in places on earth where they see very little water outside of rainfall meaning they don't live near streams or or lakes or rivers so the question is how do farmers who have no access to water how are they able to grow crops now, let's just take as an example of a farmer in the Near East, far from any lake or stream. Well, there's water that comes in from we will call the Mediterranean Sea. The Mediterranean Sea, there's this evaporation effect that now takes the water up into the clouds, carries the water in the sky to where the farmer lives and where he's growing his crops and releases the water. Now, check this out. How much does that water weigh if this farmer's fields are going to be adequately watered? 
Well, the, the sky carries to the farmer's land. If one inch of rain falls in one square mile, that would be 28 million cubic feet of water, which is 207 gallons, which is 1.6 billion pounds of water. That's heavy. All because of the evaporation effect. So it evaporates, it's carried. Now, the question is, but if it's from the Mediterranean, there's salt involved. So how does salt water help a farmer's land if we know that salt water could kill crops? Well, there's this process in it being evaporated and carried where the salt is taken out. So the sky picks up billions of pounds of water from the sea, takes out the salt, and carries it for 300 miles and dumps it on this guy's farm. Now, if all of a sudden you dumped a billion pounds of water, would that not hurt the crops? Well, the sky dribbles the billion pounds of water down in little tiny drops. They have to be big enough to drop for a mile or so without evaporating and small enough to keep from crushing the wheat stalks. Well, how do these microscopic specks of water that weigh billions of pounds get it heavy enough to fall? It's called coalescence. What does that mean? It means that specks of water start bumping into each other, and the more that bump together, they begin to get weight and fall and drop. And that is only due because of electric electricity that exists in the atmosphere that allows those water droplets to bump into each other. Billions of pounds of water carried in the process, having all the salt taken out of it, dumped in little tiny droplets so that a man's farm is adequately watered. And we want to chalk this up to pure coincidence. Perhaps like the psalmist in Psalm 148, verse 4, we should just stop and say, Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. That what we take for granted is an incredibly fine-tuned process by God alone so that this world is able to sustain life. Amen? This is an incredible feat that stops us and says, thank you, God, for creating the processes that you do. So here's the troposphere. There's waters above. There's waters below. Let me just tell you, At this time in Genesis, the environment was different than it was after the flood during Noah's day, which is one of those topics we're going to discuss when we get to Noah, which should be about 2032. I think that's the date. (laughs) At this time, there was a canopy of water that enveloped the earth. That during the time of Noah, in order for there to be this large amount of flooding to take place, water, it said, didn't only come up from the ground, it was released from the sky. This is why there could be life forms that existed that were not present after the flood. Perhaps dinosaurs, um, longevity for humans, because you look at a guy by the name of Methuselah in Genesis, and this guy lived to be 960 some odd years of age. And you sit there and go, really? And people go, because the atmospheric conditions to sustain life were different then that enabled men and women to live longer than they do today because this canopy of water had this amazing effect of, of allowing some radiation into the environment and leaving other parts of radiation out. And it was able to suspend life in a way that's different than what we know today. And again, this is all recognized within the scientific community. So the earth here is warm by light. Now it's robed in blue and it's dappled with clouds floating over the sparkling sea. God's not done yet. Now he creates the earth. So now not only does he have division for the waters, now he sets boundaries for the waters. And what does he do? He creates, he actually doesn't create, he brings forth the land by commanding the seas to part. So you have this core of land that's covered by waters. Now God is going to create boundaries for the water. So there's no new creation, but a final ordering of what we know as planet Earth. So here's the emergence of land. Now look at verse 
9, And God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place. <laughs> Which is awesome, right? So he's taking the waters and says, By the command of his voice, be gathered into one place. The idea here, and I, and I don't want you to miss this, the, the language that's used is the same word that can be translated synagogue. Now you're asking yourself, what does that mean? The synagogue is the gathering of God's people. So when God gathers the sea into one place, it is a unified, harmonious gathering of what glorifies God. He speaks and this thing's gathered into one place. Now the reason I mention that is because I think of the church as the same way that I think of a synagogue. It's the gathering of people, regardless of race, amen, regardless of demographics, regardless of, 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 of marital status, regardless of, of job vocation, all are one in Christ, amen? And when we gather, we are the church. And the reason that this is important is because, did you know in Revelation chapter 22, when it comes to the new earth, the Bible says there will be no longer any sea. Check this out. Revelation 22, verse 1. In the new earth, there will be no sea. Because when God brought everything together in unity and in harmony, he had a purpose. I want men and women to be one. I want them to worship me and I want them to be a true community. But what has oceans and seas done today to this world? It has fragmented us. And in the new heavens and new earth, it says this in Revelation 22, there'll be no longer any sea. Why? Because God wants to remove any barrier from us connecting as human beings. That is awesome. Some of you are going, but I like the sea. Oh, he'll more than make up for your, your wanting to be by the sea. Like you're thinking your place in heaven is going to be like a beachfront perfect apartment, right? Right there looking out over the earth. God will make up for that, trust me. But he gathers in one place the sea so that there's now this emergence of land. And all of a sudden the material that is in its unformed condition buried deep beneath the surface of the oceans rises. Solid ground comes into existence because God gathers all this water into one place. Now check out these verses, and I, and I love Psalm 104. The psalmist, and I already told you about Psalm 104, how you need to read it this week, how Psalm 104 really gives us this creation meditation. The psalmist is looking back, and in Psalm 104 he says these words, starting at verse 7. So, at your rebuke, they fled. What fled? The waters. At the sound of your thunder, they took flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they may not again cover the earth. The psalmist wants you to know the creator behind what we experience as this planet is in his command. That there are part that every part of creation just God speaks and it happens, right? He separates the waters, creates sky. He creates boundaries, and they obey his voice. The waters are now bounded by land. This is what we would call, and many of you probably studied, Pangea. You guys know about Pangea? At one time, all the continents, all the land was one piece. And whether you want to call it a uh, continental divide, whether you want to call it plate tectonics, whether you want to call it volcanism, that there over time, those plates began to separate. And if you look at a map, it's like, oh man, it seems like the world fits together like a puzzle piece. And at one time, it was all one big land mass. Well, I, I believe that's true. And that during the time of Noah's flood, that's when we begin to see a lot of these atmospheric and land things change in our world. But I love how Job considers this thought. Job 38. When, you know, everyone's railing against God and Job has these horrible advisors in his life. Job is sat down by God and God basically starts questioning Job. Like, who are you to question me, right? You're the creature, I'm the creator. Look what it says. Who shut in the sea with doors when it bursts forth out of the womb? When I made clouds its garment and prescribed limits for it and set 
bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Oh, I mean, you hear God say that like, Job, you don't, you don't think I got this? You don't think I'm powerful enough? Look at the world around you. Everything that is taking place environmentally is because the voice of God commands it to do what he wants it to do. Wow. As you consider this like me, don't you feel small? Don't you feel powerless? And that's not a bad thing. Because sometimes we think, I think we get too grown up spiritually. I think we begin to think too highly of ourselves. And I think the writer of Genesis wants us to be humbled by the sheer magnificent power of god god's creative work is all around us this is why in proverbs chapter 8 the the writer writes these words about wisdom and wisdom is really personified here because wisdom is really god's wisdom when he established the heavens i was there wisdom when he drew a circle on the earth when he made the firm the the skies above when he established the fountains of the deep when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command when he marked out the foundation of the earth awesome scripture is replete with examples of the power of god in creation Why are we talking about this? Because if God has incredible power and command over his creation, what kind of encouragement does this give us as those created in his image? I mean, picture yourself, New Testament. Here the guys, the disciples are out on the boat. There's a storm rocking the boat. Jesus is snoozing. He's tired. He's been feeding people and loving people. And, you know, he just needs a little break, right? And they're like, Jesus, we're all going to die. And Jesus goes to the edge of the boat and says to the storm, Stop. Jesus turns to the disciples and says, you guys done whining? Because I got some Z's to catch. That's, that's my loose interpretation of it. But I wonder, we look at our lives and we get so debilitated by stuff where God goes, you don't think I got this? You, you don't think I love you? you? You don't think I care for you? Consider the power of the ocean. I determine its limits. I determine how far that wave goes, and it goes no further than what I command. You don't think I'm powerful enough? I'm the one who brought the mountains up. I'm the one who has done all these things that should have your jaws in your lap and you're sitting there worried. Don't you know how I want to take care of you, God says. Jesus says to the storms in our life, stop. Because he is Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, you have nothing to worry about. All these things that appear like they're going to destroy your lives. God has promised you something far greater. He's promised you salvation. He has promised you eternal life. He has promised to never leave you or forsake you. And he has promised that he would never crush you. This doesn't mean life would be easy, but this means that when there's those moments in your life that are not easy... What are you looking to, to trust? And God says, consider creation. If I care for the waves and the oceans and the mountains, how much more do you think I care for you? Amen? Perhaps we pray that in our hearts. When we come to those moments where we're having a hard time trusting God, God, can I just hear the voice of Christ say, stop? Can Can you just calm my heart and just send me some sort of announcement that Jesus, being Lord of Lords and King of Kings, to hear him say, stop. Because if he has destroyed the power of death, the grave, and sin, don't you think he's got all other stuff taken care of? Amen? Read Romans 8 this week. So my prescription to you, two verses, call me in the morning if you want to take it. Psalm 104 and Romans 8. God's got this. Amen? This is why we have what we have here. 
I was listening to, uh, so I'm a big Amazon fan. I've been an Amazon member for a long time. I was probably one of the first to sign up for Amazon. And uh, there's never a day where there aren't packages at our door, at our, at our house. My kids are like, oh, great, what did dad order again? And there's packages here, right? Esther Jorgen packages being delivered. I mean, I'm an Amazon freak. And uh, so the new thing with Amazon is Amazon Go, right? Where they've created these stores where you don't have to have connection with anybody. You go in, get what you need. You don't even need to check out because it automatically registers what you pick up. It automatically detects what you're leaving the store with and automatically bills your account. And you never have to say hi to anybody. As a matter of fact, that was the lead story on NPR this week. Some guy said, I love the idea of living in a world where I don't have to interact with another person. And I stopped, and I thought to myself, what you're settling for is being less than human. Because it is not only our human connectedness that is so rich and rewarding i'm glad god didn't adopt this man's relationship policy and say i don't ever want to have connection with you why does god do what he does he does it because he is getting ready to bring life to planet earth he's ready to bring plants he's ready to bring animals and then the cream of the crop of his creation you and i humans And he does it because I want to have relationship with you. And that is remarkable. Point number two. So he brings fullness to creation. So he's brought order. Now things are not chaotic. Now there's some order. Here's a little stat, a little side, a little bonus. Did you know, because, you know, sometimes we look to the scientific world, where is there some verification of the stuff you're talking about? At what point did the mountains, you know, were they submerged under the ocean that... did you know they have found seashells on Mount Everest? You know this, right? Like They're baffled. Seashells at Mount Everest. That would be pretty awesome. So point number two, bringing fullness to creation. So God creates, second day, the sky. Notice he doesn't say it's good. Second day, he doesn't say it's good because he's not done working with the waters yet. That's day three, right? Now he says, let them be gathered in one place. Let the dry land appear. And then he says, this is good. Then verse 11, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them on the earth. And so now God gives us this first picture of life. Now it's not conscious life. But it is life. He dries out the land enough to bring forth vegetation. And there's three types of vegetation that are included in this that you need to write down. He creates grass, the kind you walk on, not the kind you smoke. He creates plants. He creates trees. Here is what is remarkable about these divisions. Even science today categorizes vegetation in these three groups. There are grasses, there are uh, seed-bearing plants, and then there are seed-bearing fruit trees. These are three major classifications that any botanist or horticulturalist would be aware of. So now God brings this life to earth, which is self-sustaining and has the ability to reproduce. What we are going to discuss for a few minutes is the fertility for the earth. And then we'll close out, but we won't finish, the futility for the evolutionist. Some of you are like, oh, this is what we've been waiting for. So here's the first appearance of life, verses 11, 12, 13. Notice the word creation is not used. God says, let the earth sprout. So there's something in the earth that allows this vegetation to come forth. See, creation in biblical language is used for higher life forms. God creates animals. God creates 
humans. When it comes to plants and trees, etc., these are not higher life forms, but they are important to sustain the higher life forms. Isn't it cool? God said, I need to set up a source of sustenance for what I'm about to create. How many of you praise God for sustenance? I praise God a little too much for sustenance, but that's another story for another time. Did you know in the grass world, there are over 5,000 different forms of grass on planet Earth? Did you know with plants, there are over 100,000 different species of plant life? God has created this world with such amazing splendor of majesty. We have, we have to stop and admire it. Because he is preparing this world for habitation, he's providing food, he's providing sustenance, we need to consider what is he talking about here with these plants. Notice the key is fertility. And that each plant, each tree produces, circle the word in your Bible, after its kind. After its kind. Meaning he has created within this life form a genetic code that says it will continue to reproduce exactly after its kind. This is the mystery of the DNA molecule. That there is information encoded on life forms in our world that you cannot just chalk up to one original life form coming about because of amino acids and molecules in motion and explain the differentiation that exists in the plant world, in the animal world, in the human world. That everything has been created after its kind. That you and I did not crawl out of some primordial ooze. That life has intentionality behind it, design behind it. That's why the words after its kind appear more than 10 times in this first chapter of Genesis. Because God does not want you to sit there and chalk up your existence or anything in this world to pure chance. Every seed is programmed to bring forth what it is programmed to do. This is why you will not be able to plant a palm tree and then get an avocado tree out of it. Because it is not coded that way. I am not going to you know, raise a child and it looks like a baby in its infancy, but in its genetic code, it's really a crocodile. Right? Things do not mix like that, yet the scientific world wants you to suspend your intellectual ability and think, oh yeah, you know what, you were once a pterodactyl, or you were once, you know, uh, you know a, a, a bear, or you were once this, or once... No, 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 no. You cannot explain the differentiation that exists in our world to the processes of evolution. Even Darwin, even Darwin, who grew up in a Christian home, abandoned his Christian beliefs at the end of his work, Origin of Species, acknowledges a creator behind us. But the processes he did not acknowledge the creator's involvement in, he chalked it up to evolutionary processes. Which is where you now get the understanding of micro and macro evolution. Write those words down. This is important. Because micro evolution is change within a species which we will acknowledge happens. We're not all you know, bright-eyed and good-looking like Tom Thomas up here. You know? Some of us have got the, you know, we got the short stack, in my case, when it comes to looks and, and, and charisma, right? So my DNA is differently encoded than Tom Thomas's. If you didn't know that was Tom Thomas's name, it's an awesome name, isn't it? Hey, I'm Tom Thomas. Sorry, I'm your front row, center, your easy target. Yeah, but all of us are different, thank God, right? All of us are unique, but that's microevolution. Macroevolution wants you to believe that a bird became a dog. That, you know, a rat became an ostrich. Now, here's the problem. See, kids in school today, adults that are not in school that are still learning stuff from the the garbage they read on the Internet and stuff like that, there is no scientific proof to validate any of these beliefs in macroevolution. You need to understand, when that scientist backs you in the corner, you sit there and go, 
it requires more faith to believe in evolutionary processes than it does to believe in intellectual, intelligent design behind this, that there's a creator, that there's a designer behind it all. If the evolutionist was smart, they would admit to you that this is all hypothesis, this is all theory, and really can nothing be deduced from what they have found in this world because there is no transitional record yet to be found in this world. The British Museum has 60 million fossil artifacts. Not one shows you a transitory record from a rat becoming an ostrich. And yet they stake their lives on it. And I sit there and go, and we're going to talk about evolution some more in the, in the weeks to come. You need to understand that there is no record yet to be discovered to show us that transitional record. There are various forms within species, but to say that one species becomes an entirely different species is ludicrous. Perhaps you've heard the phrase, the missing link, when it comes to humans, right? That, you know, we're, we're going to find that missing link out there. Listen, folks, you're not missing the link. They're missing the whole chain. We have a little bit of the link. You're missing the chain. They want you to believe that there's so much evidence out there. And I sit there and go, you're crazy. That's why the new atheism, full of scientists, are no longer using empirical science to prove their atheism, now all they're doing is attacking religions. See what happens when you start losing ground and, and when you're in trouble, a dog will even chew off its own leg when it's in a trap. So here's where they're headed. They are denying what is evidential, you know, that's evidentially true, the lack of records to support their truth claims, and now they've turned atheism into a philosophical argument that why would you embrace religion because religion now causes so much violence and hurt and damage. So I sit there and go, I am so grateful to live in the day we live in. You want to know why? Because now I don't have to be a scientist. And I don't have to read all this. I, I, talk, I talk like I know what I'm talking about. I know just enough to be conversational in this. But I mention amino acids and I meant to mention troposphere only because that's my basic rudimentary understanding of this all. If you want to go deeper, you've got to talk to somebody else about that. But isn't it interesting that the scientists are losing ground because there's no evidence in creation to support their belief? And in the end, it's really a denial of God. So now let's talk philosophy and attack religion. And I'll admit, religion has done a lot of hurt in this world, but that doesn't dismiss the truthfulness of God, of Christ, of the Spirit, of the Bible, and all the truths it purports. Amen? This is why this week the doomsday clock is now set to two minutes to midnight. Some of you didn't know that. What? There's a doomsday clock? Yeah. And guess who's behind the doomsday clock? Evolutionists. Atheists, how does doomsday fit into a worldview context where you deny God? Who are you to say it's, maybe it's not doomsday. Maybe it's, you know, good day. And you guys got it all wrong, right? And these scientists are sitting there going, the world is two minutes to midnight. Doomsday is apparent. And unless we change our lives, well, what are we going to change it from? You guys have been talking about change through evolution for a long time. We're not obviously where your theory says we should be. Folks, think about this. Think about what I'm talking about. It makes sense. And you don't have to leave your brain at the door to embrace it. Amen? So the plants produce after their kind. And I'm going to close with this. There's a reason God says, I want you to know about the plants and the trees. How many times through scripture do you see spiritual connection to plant life and tree life? Think about the teachings of Jesus. How much did Jesus draw from the plant world illustrations for our spiritual lives? Stop and consider why this is important. Jesus says a parable about the sower and the seed. The sower goes out throws the seed down, and there's different responses to the seed that's thrown down. And ultimately, of the four situations, the fourth one that allows the seed, that the seed gets in there and grows and flourishes and produces fruit, that's the seed that's accepted by God. 
Well, what is that a picture of? The, the, the heart that responds to Jesus and begins to grow in Christ's likeness. How about the mustard seed? Which Jesus says is the smallest of all seeds. Because when you open the mustard seed, there's other little seeds inside of it. Some people are like, oh, mustard seed's not the small seed. you got to bust it open and look, there's other little seeds inside that thing. All genetically coded. And Jesus says, if you have faith, even faith as small as a mustard seed. Like, give God something and watch what he's able to do with it. How about the, the, the barren fig tree? Like Jesus comes upon this fig tree that is not producing fruit. And Jesus says to the fig tree, be cursed because you are not doing what you were created to do. And this is a sign to those disciples listening that this is just like unbelieving Israel. Well, I'm going to pull it back to us. If you say you're, let's call it a Jesus tree, and you're not producing fruit that looks like Jesus, then really you have a barren life and there's no seed being planted and you really don't have God, so why are you faking it? Jesus will say to you one day, depart from me for I never knew you. So now all of a sudden the plant world, we're really interested in this, aren't we? Because you expect when something is planted for it to yield fruit according to its kind. Well, now the spiritual question is this. What kind of tree are you? What kind of fruit are you bearing? And if you call yourself a Christian, and I'm very, very cautious in using that word because everyone who is born in the United States is a Christian, aren't they? It's on my birth certificate, right? No. Everyone who's born of God is a Christian. And one way we can tell if that faith is genuine is are you bearing the fruit that looks like the fruit of your Savior who you claim to know? If not, you're not who you think you are. Wrong fruit indicates wrong root. Is, is, is plants and trees important? Are they important? You better believe it. Jesus frequently cited these things as spiritual illustrations so that we could stop and consider our lives. So, wow. Praise God for the sky. Praise God for the land. Praise God for the vegetation he put on this planet. Not just to sustain us physically, but to remind us, more importantly, of spiritual reality. Amen? Next week, day four and day five. And then things are going to start really getting good. And some of you, I think, are going to get a little mad of some of the stuff we're going to talk about. But it's okay. I love you. Okay? Unconditionally, I love you. Let's stand. Let's pray. Uh, well, God, what can I, what can I say other than... You are awesome. You have declared your majesty and your splendor, your power and goodness in all that has been created. Help us not to pass by these things so fast where we miss your handiwork, where we miss your artistic display of, of not just allowing us to admire creation, but Lord, for our hearts to go to that place where we say, you, God, ought to be praised because of what you've done. You have created an environment for us to be sustained. You have created a world for us to live in. And you have not only created these things outwardly, but you've created in many of us a heart that is clean, that is new, that is something like, nothing like we've ever experienced before, so that we are now able to praise you and adore you and worship you. And I pray that's what's happened. As we look through Genesis and we consider these days of creation, Lord, thank you for the power that you have put on display that reminds us, most importantly, of the power you have to save us. You are worthy to be praised. All glory and honor belongs to you, and it's because of the work that you have performed so perfectly, so adequately, so completely in our lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Thank you 
for being a God who loves us and wants to relate with us. And it's all because of Jesus. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace and mercy forever. God bless you guys. Have a great day, all right? We'll see you soon. Praying for you all. Praying for you guys.